So yes, the next speaker will also talk about flakes, as it's a very popular topic. Please give it up for Linus. He'll be talking about flakes as well. OK, of course, the technology isn't working as, uh, as expected during the trial, uh, as observed during the trial run, so I'm going to have to look at the big screen. So, uh, hello, everybody. I'm Linus. Uh, I need my notes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I discovered Nix and NixOS for myself in 2016, and I quickly became convinced that this is the way that I want to do all my computer stuff. Um, I joined the ranks of Nix packages contributors and have been brilliant. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I've been following the call of Nix, uh, Nix since then, uh, since graduating from university. I've managed to NixOS releases. Um, and I've been on the RFC steering committee since 2021. Um, yeah, I currently work at Determinate Systems. I'm nearing the end of my employment there. Um, more on that later. I've had a great time working with them, and they're doing great work. Um, I can only encourage people to uh, work with them if, they, if they're interested. Um, this, is not, uh, this is not a Determinate Systems talk. I'm going to be uh, talking about what I think. Uh, <laughs> Primarily. Right. Um, so, yeah, Flinks. Oh, yeah, I decided um, I want to one up Ron and uh, I'm, I, I drew almost everything. Um, so, as, as Elko's uh, already described conveniently, uh, Flinks is a, uh, is a Nix feature that um, specifies a format supported in the Nix code base for. Um, for declaring and pinning dependencies between Nix code that lives in different places. Um, fundamentally, a flake is an attribute set that declares, uh, descri sorry, describes the inputs it expects, and given the inputs, uh, produces an outputs attribute set, which, as Elko described, um, can contain more or less anything. So here, oh. Oh, I've skipped ahead already. Yes, so uh, here's the scary slide. Um, so Flakes is a feature that's seeing widespread adoption, and um, people rely on it widely. As seen in the State of the Union talk, thank you, notes. Um, yeah, as seen in the State of the Union talk, the number of new projects on GitHub uh, that includes a flake.nix far outstrips the number of repositories including a default or shell.nix. Um, I think that's happening for a reason. Uh, Flakes is extremely valuable to many users and is the deciding factor for many a new users' uh, adoption or rejection of Nix. At the same time, Flakes is considered by the Nix project to be an experimental feature which may bring compatibility at any time. Changes that bring patterns used widely in existing code, I think, would be extremely harmful to the ecosystem. And I don't think we should make such changes. It really sucks that we got here, and I'm not that pleased about the decisions and non-decisions that led us into this situation. But I'd like to move forwards. And on the bright side, I think that we can fix a lot of the technical issues uh, on which some of the rejection of flakes is based while limiting the breakage introduced to a few, in my humble opinion, acceptable scenarios. So I'll go right into the properties that, uh, that I believe we can and should preserve. Future, Nix, future versions of Nix should be able, should remain able to evaluate any flake that was locked with Nix 2.13, which is the current, uh, current default Nix version in Nix OS 20.305. And differences in evaluation results, unless they resolve ambiguities present in earlier versions of Nix, should be considered regressions and fixed. What I think we can and should break for the sake of progress is relocking with a newer Nix version. That is, I think it would be okay if running Nix Flink update using Nix 2.23 uh, resulted in the Flink producing an error rather than evaluating as before. All my proposed changes leave room for the relevant incompatibilities to be recognized, 
and the errors that get thrown should come with clear explanations of what was broken, why, and how to make things work again. So, uh, on the principles of flakes, um, I, I made an effort to illustrate uh, some difficult concepts like uh, reproducibility. Uh, a given flake should evaluate to the same thing uh, no matter who evaluates it, uh, when, and on what sort of system. Um, that's, I think that's one of the very most important features of flakes, um, that, that you can always get to the same result. Um, and another one is discoverability. Um, again, uh, some, a concept that's dis difficult to illustrate, but I tried. Um, discoverability is twofold. So on the one hand, uh, there should be a mechanism for discovering flakes. Uh, the built-in registry feature is, um, to some extent, as far as I understand, aimed at providing this, but, uh, again in my humble opinion, misses the mark completely by providing no metadata or searchability on the flakes themselves. Um, so, uh, the, the most recent uh, big release by, by Determinate Systems, Flake Hub, I think, fill, fills a massive gap here. And um, I'm not using it myself yet, but I think it, um, I think it's an, I think it's an extremely important thing to have, uh, to have a place to find flakes and to find out things about them. Um, I'm not sure if it's the be all and end, if Flink Hub itself is the be all and end all of achieving this goal, but I think it's a massive step forwards. Um, so on the other side, uh, Flink should be. A flake itself, once you've found the flake that you want, uh, should be discoverable um, so that you can, you can determine whether it's actually what you want or not. Um, Elko's work on, on flake schemas, I think, is quite valuable here because it allows, um, allows enumerating, um, enumerating the outputs of a flake uh, without necessarily having, having prior knowledge of what specific outputs need to mean. Um, and it also ha has some consequences on, um, on how flakes work, uh, because you need all the outputs of a flake to be enumerable. That is, you need to be able to evaluate them without providing any further inputs. Um, and that has some consequences on the design. Um, yeah, so, so that's what enables things like Nick's Flake show, uh, this enumerability. And I think that's also very important uh, a very important feature to have. Of course, I'm here to talk about what Flakes needs and how we should dare to break backwards comp compatibility, not what it already does. So first of all, um, Flakes are currently copied to the next store wholesale for evaluation. This is terribly inefficient, um, but also Elko's done some work that avoids this in many scenarios, allowing evaluation of Flakes without them being in the store. This is called lazy trees. Since it permits copying directory trees to the store only when it's required for evaluation. Um, oh, sorry, for builds. Uh, local sources can be accessed directly from the file system at evaluation time rather than being copied into the store. Uh, GitHub inputs are fetched as zips rather than tarballs, which allows random access to them without having to unpack them, uh, and that saves uh, both large amounts of uh, storage space and uh, a huge number of files on the file system, uh, which can be painful on, on older file systems that have a limited number of inodes or on hard drives that aren't very fast at random access. Um, unfortunately, Lazy Trees in its current unmerged form does not fully preserve backwards compatibility and produces different evaluation results in some scenarios and uh, still crashes in others. Um, I think it's possible to eliminate these differences in evaluation results. Uh, and if not, we should collect st statistics on how widely the patterns that lead to differences are used, and use those statistics to inform how to proceed. Once again, um, well, I, I think if, uh, basing the evaluation on lock file versions and falling back to copying to the store when necessary is a good middle ground to take um, that would allow preserving uh, getting the same evaluation results um, in the future from, from past flakes, while also allowing new developments that improve performance and other desirable qualities. 
So I think fixing and merging lazy trees would be a significant, significant step towards making Flinks more palatable to users who regularly work with large repositories. Arguably, this includes almost all Nix users, given the size of Nix packages. But while Nix packages are still fairly snappy to copy into the store on modern hardware, larger monorepos are currently more or less unusable. I'm pretty confident that we can fix lazy trees, both the crashing bugs and the evaluation differences, and make Flinks suitable for a broader range of projects. Uh, next up, we have um, actual purity. Um, so currently, uh, if you call, if you run a command like, let me see, yes, like you, like this, um, a number of things will happen uh, that that are actually diff quite different between systems and over time. So Nix packages will be looked up in the registries. Um, currently, it resolves to this via the global Flake registry. Um, that is also an, un, uh, uh, an unstable uh, reference, which varies from time to time as, uh, Nix, as the Nix packages unstable branch of Nix packages is updated. Um, hello will be searched for in multiple places, depending on, in particular, on the system which is performing the evaluation, and um, the, the exact places in which uh, it will look besides uh, the system-specific path are also dependent on the Nix version. So. Uh, as of a couple of days ago, on an ARCH64 machine, uh, that would resolve to this um, and this attribute. Um, so what I'd like to see is, is two features. Firstly, uh, a flag or potentially default behavior even that prints out this fully resolved reference uh, so that someone else, so that you can give that command to someone else and they can get the exact same result, even if they're on a different system or run it at a later point in time. And secondly, having dash dash pure, uh, which currently only affects evaluation itself, disable all of this impure logic. So the only commands that should produce the same result, no matter where and when they're invoked, are accepted. And otherwise, it will explain why, uh, why this command cannot be, cannot be invoked purely. So that thinking about how that would break things, um, that would only break invocations that explicitly specify dash dash pure. And I imagine it should be pretty un uncontroversial, but it fills a major gap in actually achieving the core goals of Flinks without compromising the approachability of the command line. Um, I absolutely see the value in having these, this impure behavior that allows you to type uh, the top command rather than the bottom. <laughs> um, and where's my cursor? There we go. Uh, next up, uh, I'm going to talk about configurability as well. <laughs> In order to fulfill the goal of reproducibility, Flex presents a prevents access to a wide range of things that will vary depending on where and when the evaluation was invoked. Uh, Nix path lookup, built-ins.current system, built-ins.getenv, and a variety of similar features are disabled. While this is indeed very valuable for the intended goal, it breaks a number of use cases which took advantage of these features without a clear replacement. Uh, support for systems other than the most common is rare and inconsistent. There's no clear, there's no clear way to handle cross-compilation, and knobs for customization can only be exposed by getting users to write their own flakes that can uh, consume the flake that you want to configure. And there's no standard interface for, for making, these, um, making outputs of a flake configurable. Um, Elko's already briefly talked about uh, having configurable derivations. Um, I'm hoping that that could be generalized to configurable outputs. Um, that is, uh, yeah, having things other than derivations be configurable as well. Um, that's all still a bit up in the air in terms of design. Um, one thing I think I'd, I'd prefer is to have flakes be configurable rather than at their outputs. Um, that's because uh, Having, having configura uh, configuration per output um, means that there's no, uh, no easy way or no clear way to have configuration options be common to multiple outputs of a flake. Um, and uh, next up, the... Uh, sorry, I'm a bit confused about the order of, my, of the things I wanted to say. Uh, I think all options should be... 
uh, configurable statefully. Um, that's, uh, that might be a bit controversial. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, to provide a way for people not to have to type long commands, much like we have, uh, much like we have registry lookup and, um, and impure references to GitHub repos that get, that get resolved at evaluation time. Um, having configuration that can be set persistently by the user, and which, of course, would be uh, eliminated by, the, by my proposed new dash dash pure flag, uh, that enables a lot of things that, um, that there wasn't, wasn't any clear path to uh, without, without having configurable state, and even statefully configurable flakes. Now, let's see what I have here. Um, this is what I think a, uh, the, oof, trying not to break things. Uh, the declaration and use of options might look like. Um, some of you might be might be a bit uh, surprised at the use of this namespaced uh, namespaced option name. My hope is that um, namespacing options like this will allow, uh, firstly, to define the responsibility for the meaning of an option to be clear, and secondly, to allow uh, reuse of these options and, um, for example, uh, Having a having a flink that depends on unfree software be able to report to the user that um, that it requires unfree software and why, as opposed to falling back to the error message that you'll get from next packages for for trying to use an unfree package. Um, so for setting uh, setting these options, I'm hoping you could specify them on the command line. Um, which is which I think would even be allowable in the pure mode. Um, set them as uh, uh, as part of importing uh, an in, a flake as an input, a configurable flake as an input uh, in the input declaration, or even uh, set persistently in user config potentially through a through a dedicated command for manipulating config. Okay, uh, on to the next topic. Uh, we have output selection. Um, as mentioned before, the output to use is selected based on a magical system string. It's far from ideal, as it cannot convey any more detailed information about a system and is practically limited, limited to a few common configurations. I think that it would make sense to have this attribute selection to be configurable through user policy. That could potentially be as simple as providing a list of system names that are tried in order in nix.conf. Cross-compilation is also frequently cited as a major issue with flakes. I think that configurable flakes would be a powerful tool to enable cross-building things. Um, and that configurable attribute selection might also help there. I'd love to work together with some people who, who've done more with cross-compilation than me, because um, I I've done some things with cross-compilation, and it's important to me, but at the same time, I don't think I'm deep enough in the matter to, uh, to know exactly <laughs> what various approaches might have in terms of disadvantages and advantages. Uh, next up, we have registries. Um, as I've mentioned before, I think the Flink registry feature is useless for discovery, but it's one redeeming quality is that it makes command line usage of included Flinks uh, flanks included in the registry much more convenient. Um, it reduces the uh, command for running patch uh, for getting a shell with patch elf from GitHub colon nix or slash patch elf to just nix shell patch elf. Um, and more complex cases are uh, a lot more convenient. <laughs> uh, but besides the uh, limited usefulness for discovery, uh, it, the use of uh, registries for lookup of flank dependencies can use to lead to very surprising behavior. For example, on my laptop, uh, I have a local registry entry that pins Nix packages to the version used to build my laptop system. That's very convenient since it allows ad hoc commands like Nix run, Nix packages hash, Nix packages format to get a Nix version of Nix packages format whose dependencies are already mostly present on my laptop, and it doesn't need to download a fresh Nix packages uh, whenever, the t uh, whenever the cache has expired. 
However, that same registry entry is also used if I run Nix flink update on any flink that uses Nix packages as an input without specifying exactly what, where it should come from. The resulting lock can only be used on systems that already have the same lap Nix packages as my laptop in the Nix store. That's extremely inconvenient, um, especially if I, if I open a pull request bumping the flink.lock, uh, which has happened to me before. Um, it's broken the CI, and uh, I was very surprised to find that. Um, my opinion is that the registry is important and useful for use on the command line, though it should be fleshed out significantly in order to provide discoverability as well. It should, however, never be used for the purpose of resolving the dependencies of flinks, unless the flink brings its own registry, which there may or may not be a use case for, but I think that's a topic for another time. So if this were implemented in the way that I like, it would break the locking of dependencies which aren't referred to fully. So flanks that refer to an input via the registry, um, that is, for example, if you just have an outputs function that requests the Nix packages, but no inputs description for where Nix packages should come from, um, they would fail to evaluate if there's no flank.lock, and they'd fail to uh, update registry-based inputs um, in using future versions of Nix. Um, so using Nix flank update or any other command with the dash dash update input option. But it would not break the evaluation of flinks that refer to an input through the registry which already have an up-to-date lock file. And lock files can still be updated with compatibility to new of Nix versions by using an old Nix version. Therefore, I think that's a breaking change worth introducing in an upcoming minor release of Nix. And now on to one of the biggest and most complicated topics, dependency resolution uh, in a more general sense. So by default, Nix will resolve dependencies recursively, always respecting the flank.lock of a dependency flank. For example, if your deploy flank depends on the Nix packages flank and the attic flank, and attic in turn also depends on the Nix packages, two copies of Nix packages will be, will be brought in. Um, or even three. <laughs> this behavior is desirable because it means that projects like Attic will always be built against the versions used upstream. It's undesirable because it can lead to an explosion of Nix packages versions, which brings with it significant space and bandwidth usage. Each Nix packages table weighs in at about 40 megabytes compressed and 190 megabytes uncompressed. Additionally, many dependencies come from GitHub and it's easy to run into rate limits when updating flinks with moderate release size dependency trees. To make matters worse, uh, Nix packages introduces mass rebuild changes quite frequently. So if the same package is obtained from new, two Nix packages versions, which are more than four weeks or uh, a release apart, it will take up approximately the, amount, the same amount of space twice, since none of the dependencies are shared. This can result in huge dependency closures on build results. There's one tool included in Nix that allows combating this problem a little. A flake may specify dependency replacements for its dependencies. Um, so in my example, I could specify that Attic should use the, Nix pack use the same Nix packages um, as I'm using at the top level. Uh, this is usually done using follows. Um, which would, well, yeah, this, this for example would make uh, Attic use exactly the same Nix packages both for its Nix packages stable and for its Nix packages inputs. However, doing this for every Nix packages in a dependency tree is a bit unwieldy. Uh, I have 40 follows lines in my, in my flank.nix and I'm not too thrilled about that. And in addition to being unwieldy, it leaves room for dependency updates to bring in new dependencies, inflating the evaluation time closure and the build results closures once again. Um, Requiring diligence on the part of users on every flank update to ensure that their closure isn't accidentally increased is, in my opinion, untenable. There are various levels on which I'd love to be able to adjust input resolution. Uh, per invocation command line flags, the results of resolution like this should probably not end up being recorded in the lock file, uh, much like override input currently does. Um, I'd like to be able to configure configure resolution for all inputs of a particular flake, including transitive inputs. And I'd like to be able to configure it for 
Oh, I've said it in the wrong order. Well, uh, for each in input individually. Um, there are also various things that I'd like to be able to do in this configuration, um, such as ignoring stream, uh, ignoring lock files from dependencies, um, allow, uh, allowing use of registries or disallowing it, um, bringing your own registry that will be used for resolution, um, or specify a resolution that will always apply to an input declar declaration matching certain criteria. Uh, so I'd like to be able to say that any input in the, in the whole tree that, uh, that's specified as github colon nix slash nix packages uh, should be resolved to the same thing. Um, that raises a lot of questions, like how, how you'd actually configure that. Um, and I don't want it to end up causing gratuitous copying and pasting of complex rule sets, um, but using sharing these rule sets between uh, between flinks could be could present a chicken and egg problem if uh, if you want to get your dependency resolution rules from an input. Um, thankfully, the current lock fo format exposes all the nodes of the dependency graph. Uh, let's see. Yes. So here's an example node of a uh, of a dependency graph. Um, and Nix will accept locks where the locked uh, attribute is completely unrelated to the original. That allows experimenting with alternative resolution strategies outside Nix. And maybe the future even lies in Flinks providing their own dependency locking tools rather than having anything beyond the rudimentary algorithm we already have inside Nix. I could even see a future where Nix will happily proceed if inputs have unknown types as long as there are corresponding up-to-date lock nodes, which it knows how to work with. That would result in a much more open-ended Flink ecosystem and allow implementing diverse input types independent of upstream support in Nix, opening the door for experimentation with real dependency resolution algorithms, um, for example, using SAT solvers to satisfy version bounds, but all that without committing the ecosystem to any particular solution. My main project for the hack day will be to try implementing such a tool because we already have all the functionality inside Nix uh, that should be necessary to support that. And if anyone wants to join me, I'd be glad to hear from you. Next topic is encapsulation. So one of the nice things about Flinks is that they provide a clear way for one piece of Nix code to provide a well-known interface to another. Well-known output names with broadly followed conventions on what they mean are really nice to have. Unfortunately, there's one big gap in this. The most important one is that Flink inputs can be treated not only as attribute sets of outputs, but as directory trees too. One widely used pattern is having a Nix packages input and using the import function to insert overlies or apply configuration. Overlays. Uh, this sucks. It exposes the full directory structure of a Flink as part of its usable interface and makes any refactoring of a Flink's directory structure or other internals potentially breaking. I'd therefore like for the outpath attribute to be removed from inputs, from, from any inputs that don't have flank equals false set and are thus nothing but directory trees. That's probably the change on my shopping list that would break the most existing code. Uh, the import inputs.nix packages pattern is used widely, and it, indeed it's the only way to specify config for Nix packages with flanks currently, as far as I know, and my proposed change would break it. However, judicious use of lock files can once again ensure that an existing code will only be broken as dependencies are updated with a new Nix version. Compatibility can then be ensured by providing out paths when the lock file version is older than the version which introduces the change, and adding an attribute like include out path to allow transitive dependencies that rely on the old behavior to continue to work. Flinks can still opt to expose their directory tree to consumers by providing an outpath attribute themselves as an output. At that point, it's a, chain, it's a choice made by the author of the flink that's being depended on, and the potential compatibility concerns are clearer. There are some further concerns in a similar vein, but I don't consider them to be as critical, like the ubiquitous use of standard env.munc derivation, which results in an override actress function that exposes internal machinery and um, Using this, using this override actress doesn't affect other uses of the flake which they come from, which may result in weird interactions. But I'm not sure plugging this particular hole is worth the flexibility cost nor the engineering effort. So, uh, I'm 
those are my main topics on the shopping list. Um, lazy trees, I believe we can introduce without breaking, evalu breaking future evaluation of current flakes. Strict uh, dash dash pure, um, the same applies. Configurability is something that, um, that would be purely an extension or a generalization of what flanks can currently do. So I think uh, that would also preserve compatibility. Uh, making output selection more configurable uh, similarly does not break evaluation of any, any existing flanks. Having the registry apply only to the CLI does not break evaluation of existing flakes, only updating them and can be handled clearly, uh, handled with clear error messages, explaining how to, how to improve, how to fix the problem. Um, external dependency resolution is something we can already do. And no more directories, uh, likewise, can be handled by, uh, by varying the behavior depending on the lock file version. Um, I think it's much more important that we be able to evaluate things that evaluate now in the future as well than to get everything right now. And, I've, and we can still leave plenty of rough edges, rough edges, particularly on the CLI, open for breaking changes so that we can get things more right later on. I also think that there's great potential outside of Flakes, shout out in particular to Infinisil for his work on work in progress RFC on generalizing pure evaluations to the to non-flink use cases. I think that's very exciting. Um, but I think my point here is, uh, if we have the right definition of stabilization, I think we're very close to be able to, uh, to, be able to stabilize flakes. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that that's a presentation of stabilizing flakes uh, that, sound, that, that could be a lot less scary for, for any of the people who have concerns about stabilizing flakes. Um, and it's a future I'd like to see. Um, I've drawn from various sources, but this is by and large my own work, and I have occasionally been proven fallible. So if anyone sees any big holes in my thinking, I'd be grateful to have them pointed out. Uh, I'm also looking forward to hacking together a new dependency resolver on the hack day. So come find me or write to me if you want to join in. Um, and I'm not sure if we have time for audience questions. Uh, I'm, also happy to, I'm also happy to take questions personally okay. later on. I'd like to take one small question, that's fine. Yeah, okay. One question. At the very <laughs> back, sure. You're making me really <laughs> work out for this. Okay, Go, Brian. We believe in you. Thank you. Great talk, thanks. Um, quick one. Let's assume. Oh, I'll better stand. Let's assume there are breaking changes. Um, what would the process be like to determine how we break compatibility, and you know, what's the right way to do it? What's the right time to do it? Basically, the policy surrounding a a, a, a breaking compatibility. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of things to evaluate, particularly how much existing code is broken. Um, but in a lot of, I, I find it hard to imagine a future in which, um, in which Nix will make breaking changes that prevent, uh, prevent evaluating past code, um, even if at some point uh, we, we get a complete replacement for Flakes um, and Flakes is no longer supported. Uh, I find it hard to imagine that Flink Compat will no longer work. Um, so I, I don't really see... Uh, well, yes, I, I suppose there's a lot of things to evaluate for, for breaking changes, um, but I don't see any major holes that would require ba breaking changes to fix at this point. Okay. And we can worry about that in the future. <laughs> okay, I'll follow up with some, uh, some, some questions directly then. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, so thank you all for your time. Uh, I'm Linus. Uh, I am also, as mentioned before, uh, Monday will be my last day at Determinate Systems, and I am looking for independent consulting contracts. So if anyone would like to work with me, feel free to get in touch. Um, that's all from me. Thank you, Linus.